Uh, Deji Baisalukatun is the author of two novels and his fiction has appeared in five different book collections. His novel, After the Flare, won the 2018 Philip K. Dick Special Citation Award and was chosen as one of the best books of 2017 by The Guardian, The Washington Post, Sci-Fi.com, Tor.com, Kirkus Reviews, amongst others. His novels, Nigerians in Space, his novel, Nigerians in Space, a thriller about brain drain from Africa, was published by Unnamed Press in 2014. He is currently the head of social impact at the audio technology company Sonos and a Future Tense fellow at New America. And we'll pop his website. Oh, Minna has already popped his website in the um, chat. So it's a super honor to finally actually meet you in person, Deji, even though we've emailed for years. So yeah, it is. <laughs> thank you for having me here. So I'm yeah. going to share my screen and let me know if you have any issues. Fantastic. OK, thank you, Saskia. So um, um, this is uh, just in case you got in the wrong room We're talking about scent and speculative futures today. Um, at the Art and Olfaction Experimental Sense Summit, and I'm really honored to be here. So I've been fortunate to be a judge um, for the Art and Olfaction Awards three times, and each time has been extraordinary. Um, those little vials just make my day and uh, make my year, because they usually start in the beginning of the year. Um, I have had the privilege of just smelling some extraordinary perfumes and scents, um, some very strange and uh, but all of them uh, thought provoking and um, it's just one of the most exciting things that I do to be able to yeah, spend a lot of my time uh, writing as you know or uh, doing policy work um, and I can talk about that in a second but um, it's, it's exposed me to some really creative ideas and it's, uh, it's just been an honor to be a part of it. Um, Saskia already mentioned these two books, um, my two novels if you're interested. So this one you probably haven't read because I self-published it about 10 years ago. And this was really when I was starting my writing career. It actually has the first piece of fiction I ever published in it as a short story. Um, and uh, I mention it because it's what drew me into the world of scent um, and perfumery. Uh, the story talks about uh, a number of things. It's actually a historical fiction novel. And, but one of the main, um, characters or some of the main characters come from a quilombo and a quilombo is the group of runaway slaves in brazil these were slaves uh, under the portuguese who um, ran away to the rainforest and then they would set up communities um, sometimes they would mix with indigenous people and in the plot of the story uh, this group of runaways survive because they still need goods from the outside world by trading with uh, europeans um, aromatic woods um, that form the basis of perfumes. Uh, this is something that actually does happen, uh, that there are certain woods in the rainforest in the Amazon that uh, perfume companies, at least when I wrote the book, uh, they, would they would use those woods to form the basis of different perfumes. Um, and uh, what I explore in the story is what would happen if a culture had been doing that for hundreds of years. Uh, so if scent played such a fundamental role in the culture, would they express themselves differently? Um, and it, it goes into a little bit of fantasy where uh, not only can they express themselves di differently, they can essentially disguise and disappear um, by using scent and applying different um, scents that they use um, and find uh, in, in the rainforest. So that was kind of my first exploration. There are other parts of the story that I'd probably rather forget. Um, but that one, I think I did a good job. And it brought me into the, uh, into the world of, of writing about uh, speculative futures. And that was more of a speculative path. So the next one was a short story I wrote. And, um, and that uh, was about a social media company that uh, uses scent. So you don't just send a video or a photo over this social media platform. You also send smells. And it's written from the perspective of, and this is near future, of someone who works at that company and has to decide about whether content that they see should stay up or, or go down. And I wrote this, um, I think, five or six years ago, before the conversation about moderation on platforms like Facebook had really taken off. Uh, so it wasn't popular knowledge yet that these companies on YouTube and so forth, um, that people who have to review these videos and decide what should stay up or should go down. Um, but the idea was, it was looking at it through scent. And um, 
uh, you know, so I, I kind of got pulled, and I think that's what led directly to being in the Art and Old Faction contest um, and being a judge there. And I thought um, just because uh, science fiction is is really just a rich and amazing field, um, really almost anything you could think of was written 50 years ago in the field, and, and that includes um, this little book, which if you haven't read it, it's worth it. Uh, it read the Hugo Award in 1966. It was written by Samuel Delaney. He was, I think, 23 years old. It's a dense little book with so many ideas. Um, it's, you have to take your time with it. Um, but the navigators, uh, as they move through star systems, use scent as a tool to help them um, explore the universe. And then I reached out to two editors who are extremely well read in the science fiction field, Gordon Van Gelder and John Joseph Adams. And I asked them, hey, uh, you know, I'm doing this talk. Can you tell me of any stories that come to mind? One of them was Ray Bradbury's Ascent of Sarsaparilla. And it's about a couple who are kind of revisiting their memories um, as, as the, the main character kind of cleans out his attic. And um, it op both opens and closes with um, this, this sense of sarsaparilla, sarsaparilla. and the, the final line is the old, the familiar, the unforgettable sense of drugstore sarsaparilla. Um, and another one is a um, pretty strange story to read, um, but I think today would still be, you know, grounds for a movie. Um, it's called Storm Warning, and it follows a meteorologist who, in the, and is written in the 1940s, who is out on horseback trying to make sense of a weather pattern that's coming. And it turns out to be these kind of crystalline um, mother of pearl um, balls that drop to the earth. And as they kind of are near this crash site, which they think are meteors, um, they start smelling all these strange things, especially burning rubber and zinc ointment. And at the end of the story, um, the author concludes that, um, it, it, or the narrator concludes that these were actually gaseous beings. They never actually took physical form but they um, express themselves um, through scent. And, um, you know, just the last line, it was the air of somewhere, I don't know where, somewhere out among the endless reaches of the stars. And for me, reading that story, it's like, geez, this is from 1942. You know, this would be easily a Hollywood film today. Um, and that just shows the, the, the uh, diversity of the sci-fi uh, storytelling experience. So one thing I wanted to mention, because this is about speculative futures, is there's a one area that I work in, which is policy, is um, uh, it's called strategic foresight. And what that is, is kind of trying to apply science fiction thinking and tools to try to imagine better policy outcomes. So if we want to have better roads, or if we want to have uh, better use of renewable energy, or if we want to have um, a better use of the internet, what would that look like? And you can kind of work through these scenarios to do that um, and use the tools of science fiction. It's become almost an applied science, um, as I mentioned, called strategic foresight. If you're interested in learning more about this, Kevin Bankston um, has written a good overview post at Slate maybe two, maybe three years ago, three, four years ago. Uh, Madeline Ashby and Carl Schroeder are both uh, accomplished sci-fi writers who are often involved in those kinds of um, scenarios. They get hired by governments by nonprofits, by companies to try to imagine, um, you know, different futures. And uh, I think it'd be really fascinating for Scent to play a role in that conversation. So for my writing, uh, I'm Nigerian American, that's my background. Um, and uh, you could say that I fall within the Afrofuturism uh, writing uh, tradition, if you want to call it that. Afrofuturism, if you're not familiar, touches everything from music to art, um, to fiction, to painting, and um, there's just a it's, a, it's a big field. It's actually an academic term that sort of encompasses a lot, and, uh, you know, it's kind of vague exactly where the boundaries lie, but for me, it's about um, writing, in, with respect to writing, writing about, um, you know, people of color, people of African descent, and giving them agency, so that the story doesn't, um, they're not just a sidekick, and the story turns on um, a white character, um, but that they are actually the person driving the narrative forward. And my particular thing that I focus on is often that they're, they have a technical background and they may be a scientist or um, in, a, in a way that you don't often, you're starting to see a little bit more, but 
you don't often see um, in, in popular media. And that's, that's something when I wrote it was I had seen almost nothing where you would find an engineer or a scientist driving a story forward. Uh, so I think that's important. And one of the themes of um, Afrofuturism, it's really an empowerment tool that, you know, when you're exploring the future, um, that if you, if you want to try to get somewhere better, if you want to get to a future you want, you have to imagine it. And everyone has the right to imagine that future. Um, and it's an important empowering exercise um, that happens. From my activism work, um, where I worked more in human rights, one of the things I learned is that in oppressive regimes, in authoritarian regimes, they want to close off your mind and close off the ability of yourself to imagine a different future than them being in control. So this is a really important tool that a lot of um, authors of all kinds of backgrounds are, are using right now. As, as a judge for Art and Olfaction, um, I've been really thrilled when um, we've had some African perfumers who have submitted. Um, and, um, you know, I think one thing that I would love to see, and I believe is represented in this summit, is, you know, more submissions or at least um, more perfumers who come from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, and because I, I believe people live, you know, rich olfactory lives and they can imagine their own futures through scent. Um, that, um, you know, it's just this other world that can be tapped into and explored um, that can communicate all kinds of exciting possibilities. So I thought just to make things a little bit more real, um, just, you know, offhand, I thought of a few examples um, of how you could think about speculative futures um, and, and uh, through olfactory explorations. And I thought about this moment, near future. Right now, if you're like me, you, uh, you know, when the COVID-19 crisis hit, you just grabbed whatever hand sanitizer you could find. And some of them were like horrible. They smelled terrible. You don't even know if they're legal. You know, you're like, why could, why should anything smell like this to kill a few, you know, to kill a virus? And um, I think that's pretty consistent. I mean, I'm surprised there doesn't seem to be standard uh, smell. I know there are some that put all kinds of things in it. I even had one that said it had probiotics in it, which I have no idea if it actually worked or not because um, you don't necessarily want to risk trying to kill COVID-19 with probiotics if you don't know if it's going to work. Um, but what I'm trying to say here is that a year from now, that might be different. Um, that smell is kind of the smell of the moment. Um, and some of the weird, I just had a friend who posted on Twitter that uh, she was riding a, a train uh, somewhere in Germany and she used a hand sanitizer and her hand smelled like bread. And uh, she didn't necessarily dislike it. It was just weird. Um, I've had some strange ones. So a year from now, what is that experience like? If, if you know, let's say if we have vaccine, what is that like? Um, if we don't have vaccine, this is now part of our lives. Can we do better than we're doing right now? Then I have a, a short story coming out soon um, where, you know, I think lab-grown meat, well, well plant-based meats um, like Beyond Burger and things like that, are probably going to be a big part of our, you know, our lives moving forward, and they're great for the environment. There will be some people who want meat, and uh, lab-grown meat, where it's not a, never an animal, it starts out as a, you know, pro in a protein vat. What will that smell like? Um, and then, you know, one submission from um, the contest, uh, the art and olfaction contest, a couple of years ago, was actually the scent of um, the atomic bomb dropping in here. Uh, uh, um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, the idea was it was meant to be de decaying flesh. And it was just a really provocative sample. Um, so you, on the dystopian side, you could think about what, what might that smell like um, if we had a, uh, a nuclear winter. Um, on a more capitalism side, what would it be like if we're mining asteroids? What would, the, what would those asteroids smell like if you worked for one? Um, you know, would it be pleasant? What would it be like if you took off your spacesuit and you've got all these little particles on your suit? And then looking ahead, what if we're living on other moons? What would that smell like? And I think a lot of science fiction writers, as I mentioned, I want to give credit where credit is due, have thought about this and they do write about this. But I'm just trying to present, you know, it's a way, uh, if you're thinking about how do I explore this, this is a way to get started. So I think just other notes is you, you, you want to go beyond just calling a scent uh, you know, the smell of 2065. Um, I think uh, while that can be helpful uh, in, in, you know, in, in shaping the, 
the person's perception of the scent. It would be great if it's kind of connected to some other things and specifically world building and world building is a tool of science fiction that's expanded it and, and fantasy that's expanded it all over the place. I hear it's actually a common term that um, people learn now, but that's where you talk about the characters, the sounds, the sense, sexuality, love, politics, geography, and if it's sci-fi, especially technology. That's where you really build the place and make it feel real. It's a, it's a very difficult exercise that on television um, uh, you can see immediately, uh, but in writing it's hard. It's very hard. And on television it's, it's also hard, but it's, uh, you, know, you can see it instantly. You see the world, whereas in writing you often have to develop it over time. And you know, I think the one theme is just evoking possibilities that um, you know, a powerful scent and thinking about the future, it doesn't necessarily have to be about 50 years in the future, but for me, what excites me with fiction in general and with, with creative um, expression in general is the uh, you know, evoking possibility. Can you help the, your audience reader or uh, judge or whoever, um, can you help them uh, think about a different way and make that way feel inviting or frightening or something like that. So I actually had another slide in here, but I couldn't share my screen, um, which is that uh, I was just selected for, I'm very excited about, just selected for um, 2020's uh, Best Science Fiction. It's a compilation um, that comes out once a year. And um, in that, I have um, sent as part of that story. It's not the driving force behind the story, but if you're interested in another way that scent gets used. It's a story called When We Were Patched. And I just want to conclude by like, you have the right to imagine your own future. Um, I just believe that it's a great thing for everyone and happy to answer any questions from you, Saskia, or from anyone in the chat window. Thank you, Deji. Um, what was the name of the story that's coming out in, in the 2020, When We Were Patched? Yeah, and that's actually wrong, I realized. Um, it's called Between the Dark and the Dark. That's a different story that came out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll look out for both. Between the Dark and the Dark. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and so we'll pop that in the chat for anybody who has any, uh, who wants to look it up. And yeah, just, just, uh, just following up on sort of what Mineta popped in, in our chat, um, just to highly recommend We Are the Alphanauts. It was the first uh, science fiction uh, writing that I had read ever that in involved scent to such a core degree and of course I was like oh my gosh who's this guy you know uh, and also uh, just a quick plug for Nigerians in Space which is a really good book I really enjoyed it so definitely check that out you guys if you haven't already um, does anybody have any questions for Deji there's a lot here I know a lot of themes and concepts I, I, I like the idea of thinking about um, science fiction as a sort of uh, tool for agency, I'd never really thought of that before. So is that how most people in the science fiction community imagine it? Is, I mean, do people see the potential for sci-fi in that way? Of um, I, I think in the Afrofuturism community, it, it is, is understood. Itasha Womax probably, and you can follow her on Twitter, she's great. She's the best um, voice on that. Um, she's just, if you want a positive Twitter feed, read her Twitter feed. Um, it's spelled Itasha with a Y. Okay. And, um, oh, I, I think I can just write it in the chat window. Oh, that would be great. See. Thank you. Um, she wrote an overview of Afrofuturism. So yeah, I think it's something that people are starting to appreciate. I wouldn't say that every science fiction writer does it for that reason. I think people approach it for different reasons. But um, for the African American community, a lot of writers, that's a it's an empowering tool. Um, and there are pioneers like Octavia Butler and Samuel Delaney, um, you know, who grew up in Harlem, uh, who, who've written, uh, even W.E.B. Du Bois uh, wrote science fiction um, a long time ago, over a century ago, almost a century ago. Um, and uh, so there, there is that tradition there. Uh, speaking of tradition, John John um, is wondering. Do you do you, John is asking? Could you say something about the tradition of Nigerian writers? Some favorites of his include Flora Nwapa and Amos Tutuola. Do you think that great tradition has impacted your work as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for the question, John. And I was only able to catch the tail end of your uh, your webinar, um, but I liked what I what I was able to to see. Um, uh, yes, no, I mean, Nigeria, so Nigeria, um, is a, you know, just over a hundred ethnic groups and, you know, languages and dialects. Um, but, uh, you know, as a British colony, um, 
uh, sort of came out of the British um, fiction tradition. And uh, definitely, I've been very influenced by Nigerian writers. Um, uh, I grew up here, as you can probably hear from my accent, uh, but, you know, tried to learn as many, as much about my, you know, culture, my father's culture, I should say, um, as possible. Um, and uh, there's so many great, Niger and there are a lot happening now. There's been an explosion. Uh, I think the writers were there all along. Um, it's just a matter of the uh, U.S. publishing industry starting to publish them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I think Nollywood, uh, which is the Nigerian film industry, um, kind of helped hone and, 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 and develop like incredible dramatic writing in Nigeria. Um, and some of those stories and writers are making it over to the U.S., but also in science fiction, um, a lot of young um, uh, Nigerian writers are um, are, are writing um, science fiction, fantasy. It's uh, there's just a lot. It's a it's a, a very literary culture that surprised education for a long time. So um, it's pretty exciting to see what's coming out. Um, a couple comments, just just because you're here and why not pass on the compliments. Uh, Tammy says, thank you, so interesting. Thank you, comment, so interesting to contemplate roles of scent in our future rather than as memory. Uh, Donna says she's very keen to read your work. Um, cool, so, so again, if, oh, actually a very, very simple question. Uh, Deji, what scents do you wear, if any? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty personal. Um, the scent of quasars. <laughs> I'm pretty conservative in that way. Um, I always think that I'm gonna like wear, um, I like will every couple of years get a really nice cologne. Mm. But then I, here's the gap that I've identified at least for, uh, for people like me, is I haven't found a deodorant that I trust that is, uh, yeah. has no scent. So it always combines with the other scent in a way that I don't like. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So what I really want is like, yeah, I don't like antiperspirants because all the horrible stuff that goes in there. Yeah. And, but there isn't, at least for men, I, I haven't seen one, I, whether it's for men or for women um, yeah. or for whoever, um, I haven't seen one that, um, you know, is powerful. And so that's just, that's actually the very practical reason. If that's out there, please tell me. Jazz says, at the start, you had mentioned a book that would make a good movie. Have you ever thought about how you would want smell to be incorporated in potential adaptations of your own work or other sci-fi writings you've enjoyed? Absolutely. I, I, I think, you know, that, I, I think it's, a, it's the next frontier is, is how do you bring that experience in? Um, I haven't cracked it. Um, I just think it would be so rich if you, you had that ability to smell as well as um, as nice. watch something or read something. So I, I don't know what that solution is, but yeah, that would be amazing. I, I think just sure. even having a few basic scents uh, would be more than nothing. Well, cool. Well, thank you, Deji, for your time. Uh, it's really thank nice you. to finally like lock eyes on you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for um, inviting me to join this. It's, it's really an honor. Um, the folks you've assembled here are amazing and I've been watching some of the recordings so I hope you keep posting them. Yeah no for sure we're gonna actually I'm with saving, your permission we'll post yours. <laughs> of course please do and I'm saving some of these chats because there are a lot of good deodorant um, recommendations. Yeah yeah you got a ton of recommendations. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's useful. All right, guys. Well, thank you. So, Deji, I'll demote you to, to, to regular attendees so you can relax. Sounds and, good. Um, thanks so much again for your time. Have a good day. We'll obviously be in touch. See you later. <laughs>